How much longer will Governor Kuroda really be able to try to keep the credibility of his policies when we are seeing that they're going really in opposite directions with other major central banks, not to mention that it's weakening and hurting the yen so much? Well, I, I think uh, uh, for a while, because uh, to some extent, Japan doesn't have the same inflation problem that the U.S. has. Um, inflation is picking up, but uh, Japan would like to see more inflation. And of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kuroda would like to see this uh, policy succeed. Uh, he has been at it for many years. Uh, this would be the wrong time to let it go. And, you know, uh, to some extent, the depreciation of the yen is also helpful because it enhances growth in Japan at a time of great uncertainty about growth. So there's no reason to stop this um, unless it becomes just unsustainable with markets making it impossible. What would lead to that? Well, uh, if uh, uh, the Bank of Japan has to spend enormous amounts of money in order to keep yields contained, uh, if the pressure uh, sort of uh, in the bond market increases, then at some point they may they may say that well, it's just too much. But I think we're far from that right. Are you concerned about exchange rate volatility as a result of these policy moves and that potential detriment to growth? Well, for Japan, it is helpful, right? Uh, a, a depreciating yen at this point can sustain exports and uh, could help growth uh, at a time when the war in Ukraine, the higher commodity prices, uh, all are negative for growth. So for Japan, this is uh, positive. I think one concern they have is being accused of being a currency manipulator, which is why some of these discussions trying to assure uh, other central banks as well as policymakers elsewhere that this is just normal monetary policy and not intended, uh, particularly in keeping the yen depreciated. In addition to, of course, already existing inflationary pressures, you've written at length about this idea of the economic weapons being used in war. Can you give us your view as to the sanctions that are being applied at the moment and whether you think the balance between geopolitics and economics is, 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 is equal at the moment? Well, to some extent, the resort to economic sanctions is because the international mechanism governments such as the United Nations aren't working particularly well in, uh, in uh, sort of uh, preventing or even stopping uh, the war in Ukraine. So um, I think it is a legitimate recourse to economic sanctions, but they have uh, widespread damaging effects, not just in the country against which sanctions are applied, but over time, as uh, other countries take lessons from this, and react accordingly. For example, if you apply sanctions on a country's use of its central bank reserves, then other countries might start thinking, well, do I want to accumulate reserves in dollars or in euros if those are subject to sanctions? Well, maybe I want to diversify my reserves away, or alternatively, I want to prevent activities that rely on a buildup of reserves to support those activities. The broader point I'm trying to make is that Yes, these are a new form of punishment and perhaps the only recourse that advanced countries had in response to the situation. Mm. But we also need to think about the longer term effects. And therefore, once the war is over, we need to think about what needs to be done. The idea of alternative global payment systems, especially with China trying to really internationalize the Chinese yuan, how feasible is that and in what time frame? Because we have seen a lot of restrictions on that part as well. Well, I think there will be a greater impulse to bring together countries that have been sanctioned at the very least, but also countries that fear potential sanctions or that want another diversified payment system uh, available to them in case, uh, you know, SWIFT and other forms of payment get, uh, get sanctioned for them. So my sense is there will be a greater urgency uh, uh, over time 
to develop these automated payment systems. China already has one, which still relies to some extent on SWIFT, but they will try and expand its use, limit its dependence on, on SWIFT, and bring in some other countries so that there is some liquidity in the system. Uh, they will certainly test it uh, widely. And uh, I, I presume that countries like Iran, Russia, would be interested in participating. With the extraordinary amount of pandemic support spending that we've seen globally and now rising yields, is government debt burden something that we should be now increasingly worried about? For sure, because uh, in addition to the existing debt uh, that already exists, um, in response to higher commodity prices, for example, a number of countries are being forced to uh, increase their spending uh, rather than necessarily bring them down. For example, in Europe, a number of countries have initiated moves to soften the blow on energy costs for households. And I would presume down the line that the United States may also contemplate such actions. So we already have, uh, you know, as you said, high levels of debt. We have rising interest rates, so debt service is going to become costlier. But the fiscal impulse uh, may still have to be relied upon both for you know, cushioning the blow, but also new spending such as on military uh, readiness.